Now, I think today I'll be able to sustain the thesis I made at the beginning relative to King Saul. When we began with him way back in chapter 9, why, I think I gave a harsh criticism of him, and I think that we'll begin now to see that this man, down underneath that exterior and outward veneer that made him look like a king, that underneath he was no king at all, that he's nothing in the world but just a paper doll king, and he's not truly a king in any way whatsoever. Now, we want to begin today here at chapter 13, and I'll read. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah, of Benjamin and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And now notice this, because it's very important to note. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that were in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say, that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Now, my friend, the true character of this man is beginning to come out. We're beginning to see just exactly what kind of a man he really is. And when we get a view of him, we're going to see... That underneath, he indeed, I think, can be called a phony king. Now, did you notice, friends, that when we read here, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines? Who was it that really got the victory? Well, this man, Jonathan, the son of Saul, is the one who got the victory. And I take it that he was a very capable military leader because we'll find out that he did the same thing later on of getting a great victory and using a very interesting strategy when he did it. But now, when Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines, notice what it says, Saul blew the trumpet. Saul believed in that which is not Scripture at all. If it is in any book, it's in the book of Hezekiah, along about the 10th chapter, where it says, "...he that..." tooteth not his own horn, said horn will go untooted. So Saul is blowing his own horn, but he doesn't give his son Jonathan credit for winning the battle. He takes credit for it, and he called all Israel together, and he gave out that phony report. Now, you know the army knew differently, those that were followers of Jonathan. Now, folk are beginning to suspect that there is a weakness in his armor, and that this is the Achilles heel of this man. Is he humble? We said at the beginning we thought that was false humility. And I think that which is the real Saul is coming out. Now we find out that the Philistines are still able to make war, and they are coming strong against them. And we find here Saul is bringing the people together, and he is spending so much time taking credit for winning that which he didn't win. Verse 8, and I'm reading, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. Now this is again another revelation, because he's king. This man presumes. This is presumption on his part. A little later on, we'll find that a king by the name of Isaiah presumed also, and he was made a leper. Now, this man Saul here presumes, and he's going to take the office of priest. And we're told here in verse 10, came to pass that as soon as he'd made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Saul just wasn't willing to wait for Samuel. He's impatient. And he's presumptuous, and this is what happens. Now listen. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, 
and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. He had three good reasons he fought. He's rationalizing, of course. Number one, the people were scattered. Number two, the Philistines were coming against him. And number three, Samuel's a little late getting there, and he's blaming everything and everybody else, his circumstances and Samuel, for what he did. Now, will you notice, verse 12, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. That, may I say, is rationalization. And I have not made supplication unto the Lord. That's false piosity. I force myself. That's a lie. And I offered a burnt offering. This is Saul, friends. Now listen, verse 13. Listen to Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. At the beginning, this man Samuel said, If you would obey God, then God would bless you. Now you've disobeyed. And you've disobeyed in something that a king ought not to disobey in. And because of that, Verse 14, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. In other words, the king must obey the Lord. The ruler must obey the Lord. And what this world needs today is a ruler who is being ruled by the Lord. That's our problem. That's the problem of the world. And, of course, we'll not get one until Jesus comes. And that's God's ultimate purpose, of course, in this earth. Now, God has got him a man he's going to bring on the scene. And even Samuel, at this time, does not know who it is. He doesn't even know which direction to go to find him. Although I think he's in the neighborhood... They're down in this area, I think in the neighborhood of Jerusalem. Now we are told, Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgad under Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people that were present with him, abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Now we are told here, that they are going to begin the battle. And we see here what real disarmament is and the danger of it. By the way, there are those today that are trying, of course, to disarm America. They think if you destroy all the ammunition today, that somehow or another you couldn't have a war. I can't think of any more foolish reasoning than that. And a great many people think if you just have a gun law and get rid of guns, well, all you do is disarm honest people, and you do not disarm the crooks, and you just lay them open to be violated by the unlawful. This thing today, this idealistic, foolish type of thinking. Now look at it here. Verse 19, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords of spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. In other words, the Philistines disarmed them. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks, for the axes and to sharpen the goads. These were farm implements that they used and to sharpen them, they had to go down to the Philistines. And by the way, the Philistines then were able to keep a pretty good count of just what they really had in the way of weapons, in the way of instruments, in the way, of course, of those instruments that they used for the tilling of the soil. Verse 22, So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son were there found. Only two actually had swords. Now, the others had, well, I think some were carrying plowshares. Some were carrying a mattock. Some were carrying axes. 
That was the type of instruments that they had to fight with. Now we're told, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Now in chapter 14, we are given the strategy of the battle that Jonathan carried on. And here at Michmash, and this is the chapter that we're told that General Allenby read the night before he made his attack upon the Turks. And he used the same strategy that Jonathan used to win the battle, and he won the battle against the Turks. That was back in World War I. It's quite interesting sidelight, I think, on this. And I'm not going to go into the strategy of this battle. To begin with, I'm not very well acquainted with the geography in that place. I wanted to go there, but our time was limited, and the guide just wouldn't take time to take us there. Well, he didn't have the time. I don't mean to blame him. Well, we just didn't have the time to go there. And as a result, why, we had to head in a altogether different direction, and we didn't get to see this. Another thing is, I'm not a military man. I'm sure that when General Allenby read this chapter, it was a real thrill to him to see how Jonathan did it, and it was approved military tactics, because this man, a great general and a wonderful Christian, reading his Bible, read this chapter here. Now, actually, we find that what took place is that Jonathan is the one who planned the strategy, and he was able to take his men through this very narrow pass. That was the secret of it. You see, they have very few instruments to fight with, and so they've got to get in a place where only a few can fight on either side. And that would put Jonathan and his men to a distinct advantage, you see. That was the same thing that happened at Thermopylae, the narrow pass. The Greeks were greatly outnumbered by the Persians. But if you could bottle them up, where only a few Persians could fight at a time, and the Greeks were much superior man for man, why, they could win. And here, Israel was much superior to the Philistines, man for man, but hopelessly outnumbered. And that actually was the strategy. And even I could see that, that this would work to the advantage of Jonathan. And this is what happened. And I'll not go into the detail of this chapter, and there's a great deal of it here, because we are actually after that which is a great spiritual lesson here. And we see now that in verse 18, And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. Now, he didn't need that, as we've seen before in the days of Samuel, that the children of Israel, in a superstitious manner, took out the ark. And again, Saul is doing it for practically the same reason. Now, we are told in verse 23 that in spite of that, so the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto beth so that Jonathan's strategy is what won it on the human side. And God's with this young man. He was a great young man. It's too bad he didn't live, but we'll find out later what happened to him. Now, verse 24, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until the evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies." So none of the people tasted any food. And all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. Now, the interesting thing is that Jonathan, the son, had not known this strange thing that his father had put down, that you're not to eat anything till the battle's won. Well, Jonathan's already won the battle, actually. And that is the thing that has happened here. We are now beginning to see the real nature of this man Saul. And again here, this man Jonathan gains a great victory. But again, Saul takes credit for it. And we are told here that Saul says, Now, cursed be the man that eats anything until we've been avenged. Well, Jonathan's already done it, Dad. (laughs) Saul needs to know that his son has got the battle, and he knows that, but he's not willing to give this man credit. Saul took credit for the victory. His modesty 
is now gone. Saul's jealousy is also revealed here as we are going to see. Now we read, and I'm reading verse 26, And when the people were coming to the wood, behold, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Now the army didn't dare touch it, but Jonathan, verse 27, Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in an honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Well, they hated to see this, because this boy is the one that's got the victory. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. It was a foolish thing that Saul had done. These men are weary. They fought a battle and won it. And now Saul says, I'll not let anybody eat anything until I'm avenged of my enemies. You see, his modesty is absolutely gone. And we are told here that he actually built an altar to the Lord and offered sacrifices. And then in verse 36, Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Then said the priest, Let us draw near hither unto God. Now, will you notice this section here? And I'd like to read this section in your hearing. Verse 37. And Saul asked counsel of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him, Not that day. You see, God now is not using this man at all. And Saul said, Draw ye near hither all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. Now, you see, he's not willing to take the blame himself. He said, somebody else has sinned here. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. That army stood silent. They knew Jonathan had got the victory. They knew Jonathan had tasted the honey that day. And now this man Saul is saying, the reason God didn't answer me is just because somebody didn't obey me here, and they've broken this oath. And the army knew that Jonathan had tasted the honey, and they knew that Saul was putting up a tremendous front at this time. And the army stands silent because he's king. Now I read on verse 40. Then said he unto all Israel, be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. They're not talking much, you see. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. You see, Saul knew it was Jonathan. And Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan my son. And Jonathan was taken. Of course, he's guilty. Guilty of doing what Saul didn't want him to do, or it said that there'd be a curse upon the man. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in mine hand, and lo, I must die. Die for that? And this man and Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Now what does this reveal? His own son. He would actually destroy his son if he stood in his way. Why? Because he's jealous of his son, and he wants all the glory for himself. Now let's listen to what happened. And the people said unto Saul, that army stood silent through all of this, but now they're not about to remain silent. And the people said unto Saul, shall Jonathan die? who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel. 
God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. Now, the true character of Saul is revealed, friends. I believe that we are now seeing the true character of this man. And we're not only going to see the true character of this man, but we're also going to see later on, and we'll not be able to do that today, that he will now come in direct disobedience to God. And he's going to do the thing that later on brought tragedy to the nation Israel. And had not God intervened, it would have meant the extermination of the nation. This man Saul now is revealing that he's not God's man at all, but he actually is Satan's man. And we'll see next chapter that he's not obeying God any longer, but he's following his own devices. And finally, the Spirit of God no longer will speak to him. God will give him no longer leading, and he'll turn from God to the underworld. And then we'll see that remarkable incident of going to the witch of Endor. This is a tremendous section with a great lesson, friends, for you and me in these days in which we're living, in which we're seeing the manifestation again of demonism, the occult, the worship of Satan, and all of this business of dealing with the stars and wanting to know about the future by buying a little piece of paper at the five and ten cent store. God help America today because there are a great many souls abroad. Now, friends, we continue our study in the life of Saul. Saul is the man that we have identified as Satan's man, and I trust that we have not done him an injustice by doing just that. I'm thoroughly convinced that this man was Satan's man. I personally do not believe that he was ever saved. And I feel at first that there was something of the hypocrite in the man. He put up a front. He pretended that he was God's man, but he never was. And now in this chapter, Saul's glaring rebellion is revealed in his disobedience here regarding Agag. And you'll notice that he tries to cover up his sin here. It's in this chapter now and from here on that we really begin to see the character of this man Saul until the time of his death. Now, I begin reading at verse 1 of First Samuel 15. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, this may seem extreme to any of you that are listening probably for the first time, or if you are a recent listener. But if you have followed in the Old Testament the story of Amalek, you will recognize that they were opposed to God, they were in rebellion against God, and they were those that God said he would judge because of what they had done. And added to that are the fact that these people, had they been permitted to continue to live, would probably have caused in the future more trouble than is imaginable. And you're going to say, how do you know that? Well, I know it because we find that one was spared, Saul spared one. And when you get to the book of Esther, you will find out who he was. And he tried to exterminate an entire people. 
and would have succeeded had not God intervened. So you see, when you get off and get God's perspective, then you will understand his immediate action many times. Very candidly today, you and I and the rest of mankind are not in the privilege of being God. If we were, we could make God's decisions. But until we are in that unique position, then we are not in a position to pass judgment on him, to be sure. Now we find that Saul here gathered the people together, and he numbered them. And we find that he came, verse 5, to the city of Amalek, laid wait in the valley. And we are told that Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now, this was an act of mercy that no pagan nation would have practiced in that day. And we're told that up to this point, Saul is being obedient. In fact, verse 7 reads, And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now he's fulfilling the order that's been given to him. But notice now, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and lambs. Now he thought, well, now what a shame it is to destroy everything. And so he saves Agag, who is the ruler, and he had no right to spare him any more than you'd spare the humblest peasant that was among them. This nation was wholly given to evil, and the king above all others should have been destroyed and judged at this time. And he had no right to save out the best of the cattle. It would look like that he had made this attack for the purpose of getting booty and spoil. And God forbade that, you see, altogether. They were acting as a judge for Almighty God in this particular case. Now notice, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, this is verse 11 I'm reading now, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now, you'll find out that not only did the people choose Saul, but Samuel did. Samuel loved Saul. He wanted him to make good. He wished he had made good. He loved him and actually was for him, I think, a great deal more than he ever was for David. But it was now God's rejection And Samuel, of course, must execute that. And Samuel is obedient to God, but Saul was not obedient at all. And we find out now that when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You see, he says that he's been obedient. But notice Samuel's retort to this. Verse 14, And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now, listen to this man as he begins to use double talk and he begins to use subterfuge and to attempt to camouflage his conduct. Verse 15, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. 
and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, he attempts to say that he's done this for a very pious reason, that the end here was that they might have fine, excellent animals to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, that wasn't it, of course, and that was attempting to cover up disobedience by some pious purpose that he pretends that he had in mind all along. And, of course, it was not that. And yet today you find that same kind of hypocrisy in our contemporary culture. I get rather amused to find out that the liquor interests, they give money for certain beautiful gardens and beautiful spots for the people to visit. And they like to always make it known, and the papers are apparently delighted to record it, of how much in taxes they pay each year that they are paying their way. And, of course, anyone knows that the alcoholics today are costing our government a great deal more than any taxes that are coming in for liquor. So that there is the tendency today to take that which is wrong or that which is evil. And many of God's people turn disobedience and attempt to turn it to some very pious purpose. And I'm not sure but what we're all guilty of that sort of thing. I found out that when I was a young preacher, I'd come out of seminary with an old beat-up jalopy, an old Chevrolet. And when I entered the ministry, I was satisfied with it. I was not married, and I enjoyed driving it around. My people were embarrassed by it. In fact, they got so they felt it was sort of a joke. And then I met a young lady, and I began to pray to the Lord to give me a new car. And I told him the reason I wanted it, that I would be more efficient in my visitation. And I want to be very honest with you, that didn't even enter into it at all. What I wanted was a nice car to go see this young lady. I hadn't thought of it before in helping visitation. May I say it's so easy today for those of us that are human beings and those of us that are believers even to try to put a very pious purpose to something that has another purpose altogether. And that's certainly true of this man Saul here. Now, if you'll notice, he blames the people. The people spared the best of the sheep. But we're told that Saul did that too. In fact, he's the king, and he's the one that is responsible. Then Samuel reports to him what the Lord had told him, that he is rejected. And we find here in verse 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And you notice Saul now says that it's the Lord thy God speaking to Samuel. He doesn't say he is the Lord my God or the Lord our God, but he's thy God in Gilgal. And also he blames the people now for having spared the oxen and the sheep. And he does not take any responsibility at all, and yet he, of course, is to blame. Now, you'll notice here in verse 22, though, and this is one of those remarkable passages of Scripture, 22 and 23 here. Let me read them. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. 
Now, this is God's rejection of Saul as king, and it's on the basis of his rebellion and disobedience to God. This is something that's very important for one who claims to be a child of God. Now, I hear a great deal today of this informal and friendly approach to the Lord and to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many little songs today that go something like this, Jesus is a friend of mine. Now, may I say to you that we need to be very careful how we use that type of approach to him. When you say that Jesus is a friend of yours, what do you mean? Actually, you're bringing him down to your level. If I should say to you today that the president of the United States is a friend of mine, then I'd bring him down to my level. But suppose that he went on radio and said today that Vernon McGee is his friend. Well, that would bring me up to his level, you see. Now, when you and I begin to talk about Jesus as a friend of mine, we bring him down to our level. Now, this is what he said. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Are you obedient unto him? How dare any of us today call Jesus friend if we're not obeying him? And to disobey is worse than witchcraft. And it's rebellion against God. And there's so many today that are like that and probably like Saul. You almost have to conclude when you meet one who's totally disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not his, because he's the one that calls the friends. He says, you are my friend if you do whatsoever I command you, in order not to be misunderstood. I'm not saying at all that work centers into salvation. I'm saying if you're a child of God, you've come to the place where you know him, and he says also, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'm of the opinion, if today someone would say, well, I don't love you, I think he'd say, forget about the commandments. Because the important thing is to be rightly related to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, to be a child of God is to know him, to know him personally. And that makes it different from any religion of the world. You can be a Buddhist without knowing Buddha. You can be a Confucianist without knowing Confucius. And you can be a member of any other religion without knowing the founder. But you can't be a Christian, friend, without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And to know him is life eternal. That's the important thing. And that's the reason this is such an important verse here. Now, notice the rebellion of this man. Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Notice the low motivation that this man had for doing what he did. He's afraid of the people. He wanted to please everybody. We have a lot of folk like that today. We have a lot of preachers like that, trying to please everybody. I heard of a minister. He's been a prominent minister, but he's begun to compromise, and he's given us the explanation that he wants to please everybody, he wants to get along with everybody. May I say to you that Saul's approach altogether. But somebody says he confesses here that he's transgressed. He goes on in verse 25. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, 
for he's not a man that he should repent. When it says God repents, doesn't mean he repents like a man. It means it looks like he repents. God made him king, now he takes the kingdom away from him. It looks as if God changed his mind, but God hadn't at all. In fact, God had not changed at all, but Saul had. Verse 30, Then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. Now, notice this man, Saul, here. I do not believe his repentance is genuine. And you say to me, how do you know it? Well, I know it. Look how he's covering up. He said to Samuel, he said, go with me and let's go through the forms of worship and not let the people know that I've been rejected. He wanted to repent, but he didn't want to repent genuinely and pay the penalty for it all. He was not genuine in this at all. He's attempting to cover up and be a hypocrite right through to the very end. Now, if you want to know what Samuel did, we are told that in verse 32, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. That means that he knew that he was going to get in trouble now. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Now, that may be strong medicine for some folk today, but my friend, our God is a God of judgment, and he's going to judge that which is wrong, that which is evil. And I'm glad that he is. I don't know about you. I thank God no one's getting away with evil today. You may think you're getting away with it, and it may look like that there are some in high places today are getting away with sin, getting away with dishonesty, getting away with murder, getting away with committing adultery. But my friend, God's going to judge them. They don't get by with it, not with God. And we need to make that very clear today. And Samuel executes the judgment of God upon this vile, wicked ruler. And we're told now, and Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented. He'd made Saul king over Israel. Now, when it says God repents, it means that his actions look like he's changed his mind. He has not. He said all along, if Saul didn't make good, he'd remove him. And he's removing him. And he's removing him because God still hates sin. And Saul was the choice of the people. But notice Samuel mourns for him. Samuel loved Saul, I think, a great deal more than David. And he hated to see this man fail and turn aside. And that's the reason that his words that he says to him are such strong and harsh words because of the fact they come from a person who loved him. And that, of course, is coming also from the heart of God. My friend, God's love will not deter him from judging sinners at all. He can still love them and still judge them. Our God is holy and righteous and just as well as love. Now, friends, today our study brings us into 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. Now, if you have your Bible handy there, you'll want to turn and follow along with us. We are actually dealing here with a new subject altogether. We have brought on the stage now of human action David, God's man, and we see him in contrast to Saul, Satan's man. And last time we saw the rejection of this man, Saul. God had given him not just one opportunity, but several opportunities to see if he would obey him, and he revealed that he was totally disobedient unto God. God gave him every opportunity. God has given other men, and they have made good, but not Saul. 
And the Lord didn't need to wait for the result. He already knew, but Saul needed to know. Samuel needed to know because he loved Saul. And the people needed to know because they had chosen him. And today, you and I need to know. I think that we're tested, and we do need the help of the Spirit of God because we're told that whom the Lord loveth, he testeth them. Actually, he chastens them. That has been God's method. It still is God's method today, that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And not only that, we are told, Blessed is the man that endureth testing, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. That's James 1.12. And so we see that this man Saul was tested, given ample opportunity, and he did not make good at all. Now, again, may I ask the question, why the extreme surgery in slaying the Amalekites and Agag? And I believe that, although I didn't have time to develop that last time, and I'm not taking time today, but I believe that when you get off and get a true perspective, Amalek was a son of Esau. The Amalekites were those that fought the children of Israel and destroyed them when they were trying to get into the land. And God said he'd have war with Amalek from generation to generation, that he would finally judge them. Now they've had probably 500 years to see what they're going to do. And they have definitely turned their back on God. And so he judges them. And somebody says, well, what about Agag? Well, that was the royal family. And we're going to find, if we move ahead 500 years, that was a man by the name of Haman. And if you'll check Esther 3.1, you'll find out he was an Agagite. Had Saul obeyed God, a great multitude of people would have been spared later on. You see, God knows the end from the beginning, and he knows what's best to do in any immediate situation, and you and I are in no position to give him suggestions and advice and sit in judgment of him. After all, he's the one to sit in judgment over us. Now we do come to the place where God chooses David as king to succeed Saul, and he's sending now Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint him as king. This man, David, was God's choice, and God had trouble with him. But doesn't he have trouble with all of us? He had trouble with David, and we'll see that as we advance into this book and the next one. All right, I'm reading 1 Samuel 16:1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Believe me, Saul had someone who was on his side, and that was Samuel. Samuel loved him. He hated to see God set him aside. And that's the reason that when he gave to this man the ultimatum that he was dismissed as the king and he'd been rejected, it hurt him to do that. And it makes it all the more impressive. Now we're told that God says to Samuel, Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And Saul certainly would have. Saul is not going to stand for anyone opposing him now. He's desperate. Notice, and the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And we find here, as we move on into this, that it is God that is the one that makes the choice here. And he's not giving to this man Samuel any advance information this time. 
and that, of course, will protect him. And we find now, as he moves on here, why he goes down to Bethlehem, and he comes to the house of Jesse. Now, I want to read verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, all through this section, we're meeting some great spiritual principles. Now, we saw in the last chapter that it had to do with this man Samuel saying to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You and I demonstrate whether we are a child of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether we love him or not. It's not what we say in a testimony. It's whether we are obeying him or not, whether we are actually obedient unto him. You see, the Christian life is a life of reality. It's not a life of put-on. It's not a life of pretense. It is a life of reality, and there must be that reality. And now we find here that God, when he looks at us, he looks at us actually from the inside. God is an interior decorator to begin with, and he always checks the interior of all of us. And we find that in this particular case here, God says to Samuel, now when you go down, don't look at his outward appearance. I don't judge by that. Let me pick the man this time. I'll pick the king. God sees the heart. And thank God for that. We are so apt to judge folk, even in Christian circles, by their looks by their pocketbook, by their status symbols, the Cadillac they drive, or the home they live in, or the position they occupy. God never judges anyone on that basis at all. And so he's telling Samuel, he said, you don't pay any attention to the outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. And so Jesse had his sons that were there to come and pass before him, because Samuel made clear to Jesse why he'd come. And we're told here that these sons pass by. Well, he made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. That's verse 10. And then in verse 11 here of 1 Samuel 16, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, Well, there remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And surely even the father of David would never have chosen him above the other seven older brothers. To begin with, he's a boy. It's believed that he was probably around 16 years old. I think he could have been younger than that. And he was out with the sheep. He didn't really know very much. And even Jesse's father would not have picked him ahead of his brethren to be a king. And he had just entirely ignored him. He was so sure it would have to be one of the seven sons. Now, when he finds out, that is, when Samuel finds out that there is this little boy by the name of David out with sheep, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Samuel says, This is important business, and I'm not about to sit down to rest or to eat or for any other purpose. I've come here to anoint the next king of Israel. And now notice verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. That means he was red-headed. David was a red-headed boy, and he had that kind of a temper. He had a hot temper. He was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance. And in spite of the fact he's red-headed, he was a fine-looking fellow. Now, this doesn't mean that God despises that which is beautiful. 
because God can use beauty. He's the creator of beauty. And no one that travels over this earth that we live in can refuse to ignore the many beautiful spots. All the states, you know, like to claim they have something that's quite unusual and that they have something more beautiful than the others. Well, I want to say that I've been in most of the states of this country, and all of them have something beautiful. Our God is a God of beauty, and a sunset in any state is sometimes a thing of glory. And God goes in for beauty. I resent today that the world gets everything that is beautiful, everything that's worthwhile. Why not these things be given to God and talent be given to God today? Well, this boy, David, he was a fine-looking fella. Don't misunderstand. I think he was a handsome young man. But God was not looking at that. God knew him. And we're told here he was goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, this was God's choice. And God knew this boy. God knew what you and I don't know about him, that though he failed down beneath, that faith that failed was a faith that never failed, that this man did love God. He did trust him. He did want to walk with him. And God took him to the woodshed and beat him in an inch of his life. But let me tell you, he never whimpered or cried aloud. He wanted that fellowship with God. And God loved him. He's a man after God's own heart. Now we're told, And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now we see the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who's a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Now, this man, I think, was completely taken over by Satan, that is, Saul. And his servants noted that he had this mental malady, that he had this spiritual sickness. And it is said that music, you know, has power to tame the savage breast. And so they have a contest to find out who's the great musician. Now, this boy David was a musician. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now, David was an unusual person, you see, in many ways. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass, laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. David is brought now into the palace, and Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now, this is the end of this chapter, and it tells the story of how David is to succeed in Saul's place as king over Israel. And we find here that God's method of choosing men for a particular office and task. God looks at the inner man. Saul now is forsaken of God, and David is brought into court to play up in his heart. Now, we have in chapter 17 one of the most familiar chapters, I guess, in the Bible, 
And I'm just going to hit the high points here because of the fact that it is familiar. We've all had this when we were in Sunday school, and this is the chapter that contains that familiar episode of David slaying Goliath with a slingshot. Well, you know the story, I'm sure, to a a certain extent. We're told now in verse 1, and I'm reading, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shachah, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shachah and Azekah and Ephesdamon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now here again is the war of Israel with the Philistines, their perennial and perpetual enemy, by the way. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Now, they were at a standstill here. They were just waiting to enter the battle, and they didn't want to fight. It's sort of like what we had for so long down at the canal. Here's Israel on one side and Egypt on the other. Well, here it's the Philistines on one side of the mountain and Israel on the other, and a valley between. But here was the problem. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, if a cubit is 18 inches, this man's a pretty tall man, as you can see. That means that he was about nine feet tall, and one span would mean nine inches. Nine feet, nine inches. He was a big boy. And he could have played center on anybody's basketball team or played forward, for that matter. He's a big fella. And certainly they want now to put the decision of the battle in the hands of this one man on one side and one on the side of Israel. And we're told that he had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I'm not sure just how much that would be, but it was heavy. And we're told that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Had to have one man to carry a shield. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. Well, he did that every day, but didn't do a bit of good. Nobody's coming out. And David brought out food to his brothers. And when he got there, David was alarmed that no one would go out. And so his brothers tried to send him home, but he's not about to go home. And when Saul heard about the fact that David would go against Goliath, well, he tried to put his armor on him, but David's just a boy. And he said, I'll just have to use what I'm acquainted to use. And by the way, what a lesson there is there, trying to be something that you're not or do something that you're really not called to do. And if God's called you to use a slingshot, friends, don't try to use a sword. If God has called you to speak, then speak. And if God's called you to do something else, well, you do that. And if God's called you to sing, sing. But if he hasn't called you to sing, for goodness sakes, don't sing. Today we have too many people that are trying to use a sword that really slingshots more their size. And so we find here that the thing that happens is that David goes out to meet him with a slingshot. We're told in verse 40, he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Now, I've heard it said the reason he chose five smooth stones was because of the fact he thought if he missed with one, he'd use another. Well, David didn't intend to miss, friends. He didn't need but one, actually. Well, somebody says, well, why did he take five stones then? 
Well, if you turn over to Second Samuel, the 21st chapter, verse 22, you'd read this. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. You see, he had four sons, and David was sure those sons would come out when he slew the giant. And he had five stones. That's all he needed, friends. And you know the story. It's so familiar. David said to him, The battle is the Lord's. And God gave him the victory, and the giant was slain. This is such a familiar story. We've gone over it rather hurriedly. But there are great spiritual lessons that we actually just pass by. But we need probably just say today that the giant represents the world. And Saul, I think, represents Satan. And David represents the Lord Jesus Christ and the believer today who's in Christ. David treated Goliath as an enemy. We're told, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But we're in the world, but not of it. We're to use it, but not abuse it. And we find that what a difference between David and Samson. Samson treated the Philistine as a friend. He married one of them. But David treated this fellow Goliath. He was an enemy. And the world system, this cosmos today, not the world of people, But the system in the world is the enemy of the believer today. And the very interesting thing is, is the faith of David that enabled him to go out to meet the giant. And we're told that faith is the victory that overcometh the world, and that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's the same thing that Joshua met at Jericho, and he found out that the battle is the Lord's. And he found out something else here. He could not use the weapons of this world. He had to use his own weapons, his own methods, and those were the ones that God had schooled him in. And the believer needs to recognize that today.